Is this some sort of joke, you inquire? Am I being punked here? Because this is crazy, you exclaim. A boa care guide on a Python channel? You vociferate? Oh, that is a word. Look at that. I'm going to start using it. Only in Scrabble. Hey, welcome to The Green Room. I'm Bob Bledsoe. This is Handsome Dan, and if you are a regular viewer of my channel, you might know that Handsome Dan is a Central American boa imperator. This boa is the official mascot of Green Room Pythons. I've had a lot of requests for a boa care guide, so that's what we're doing today. Oh great, now everybody's gonna think boas are good pets and they're gonna go out and buy one and get their neck squeezed. Well Kent, boas are good pets. They're actually very popular and they squeeze necks about as much as pythons do. Which is all the time! That's why we have so many deaths in this country! You done? Yes! Great, should we get back to it then? Yep. Okay, so let's say that you are a python guy, or a python lady, python person, and now you want a boa. Well, the care is not much different, but there are a few things. But what if you're totally new to reptiles and you've decided that you want to get a boa? No problem, you can use this video as one of many that you look at to learn how to take care of a snake. So, let's get to it. Handsome Dan is not interested in hanging out with me today. Look, 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 here's your ball. There you go. So we're going to give him his ball and we'll see if he stays there. I hope he does. There you go, buddy. You're all set. You can hang out there. Okay, first I want to say that there are many species of boa and this care guide is mainly for the boa imperator or BI or BCI if you use the older term. The true red tail boa or BC or BCC has similar care but do your research because that is a different species. They get a lot bigger and there are some differences in their care requirements. Now, if the store or person that you bought your snake from just called it a red tail boa, you might want to double check the species. It's not a huge deal, but a lot of people call a boa imperator a Colombian red tail. And that is not a true red tail boa, uh, which is good news actually, because if you have a Colombian red tail or the boa imperator, it's a little bit easier care. The, the other, boa constrictors are a little bit touchier with uh, care requirements. By the way, I've decided to change the way I've been pronouncing the word imperator. I used to say imperator because people say it both ways, but then I looked up the actual pronunciation of the Latin word and the Oxford Dictionary tells me it's pronounced imperator. Incidentally, Oxford also tells me to quit being such a nerd about it. And I'll tell you the same. Pronounce it however you want. Just, you know, no need to be a nerd about it. After review of your Oxford Dictionary search history, please refrain from being a complete nerd about everything. Signed, the Chancellor, Oxford University. Hmm, took the time to write me a letter, wow. Boas in general live in this circled off area, and the boa imperator that we're talking about is in this sort of Central America, up into Mexico, and slightly into South America, blacked off area right there. That whole range is mostly warm and stable, but there's some cooler areas, especially as you get down into southern Argentina, it's pretty cool, and up into uh, Mexico and Central America, it can get pretty cool too. So if you have a locality boa, it's important to take that into consideration. The boas we're talking about, just the regular boa imperator, pretty stable temps, about like a ball python, but we'll talk about temperatures, uh, but they're, they are not generally a cooler species. So here's what you can expect as far as size. Those boas that are from you know Mexico down into Central America uh, are around five to seven feet for males and up to eight feet for females. I say up to, it actually could go quite a bit bigger than that, depending on factors. But figure an average for a boa imperator, five to seven for males, eight for, for females. There are some island localities that get even smaller. Uh, Tarahamara, Sonoran, Hog Island boas. Handsome Dan is a Central American, which is considered a dwarf locality of boa, so he'll be a little bit smaller than that. Those are your averages for boa imperator. The boa constrictors get considerably bigger. Uh, six to nine feet for males and say uh, eight to 10 for females, but that 10 can get a lot bigger. It can get 12 feet plus. Uh, for the for the big females. So that's a different situation. Their bodies also are much thicker. So a boa constrictor is longer and thicker, beefier, just a much bigger snake. All right, let's talk about caging. I prefer a PVC cage over a fish tank. PVC is much easier to control your heat and humidity. 
it's just a better situation. It's going to be a little bit more expensive than a fish tank, but a better situation for your snake overall. Uh, Handsome Dan is actually upgrading to uh, the cage right down here because Echo is moving out. She's upgrading. We got a bunch of upgrades happening in the next couple days, and you'll see that. In fact, probably all the B-roll that you see of Handsome Dan in his cage uh, will be in his new upgraded situation, so I hope it turns out okay. But give them as much room as you can. Handsome Dan stays hidden a lot, but he also moves around a bit. He likes to move to different areas. Uh, he doesn't spend a lot of time just crawling everywhere, but he does like to change different positions. Handsome Dan is a bit of a climber. He likes to climb. Now, having multiple levels in your cage is a good thing to do. I don't consider that climbing. Uh, that's just giving a snake another level, like a branch to be on or something like that within a cage. I actually bring him out here to climb. I put a rope here and I let him climb up it and I let him move around and, and do things outside. So if you're able to have a station f for your snake in, you know, outside his cage in your home that they can actually do some real climbing, that's great because you don't want to have a six foot cage that you put a tree in because you're never going to be able to heat it properly. So it's got to be, it's got to be a short enough cage, give him some height, you know, but you've got to get your heat from, from the top down to the bottom. Uh, you can also use heat mats, but not on a PVC cage. You're gonna have a hard time heating a PVC cage with a heat mat. So you want overhead heating. Should we get to heating, I guess, since I said all that? I guess we will. Let me say this really quick on the climbing thing. I see a lot of people post uh, on like Facebook or something. They'll go, they'll have like a stick in their, in their snake's cage and they'll go, look at my ball python climbing. People say that they don't climb, but look at them climbing. Imagine if you saw a snake, you know, whether it was a boa or a ball python or anything in the wild, and they were just crawling over a stick that was up off the ground a few inches. You wouldn't look down and go, look at that snake climbing. You would just say that snake is navigating its terrain. Uh, and that's all they're doing in a, you know, that's all a snake is able to do in a cage like that. Even in a cage like this, going up on this, on this uh, log right here, this is the inspector, one of my ball pythons. He, you know, climbs up onto that, but that's not climbing. That's just getting up to another level, which all snakes will do, including your Kenyan sand boas who like to live underground. You give them something to get up on, on a different level, they'll do it occasionally. All right, that's all I have to say about climbing. Uh, let's, let's, talk, let's get back to heating. So your boa is gonna need a heat source on one end and a cool side on the other end. Snakes aren't always just looking for heat. They need a, a gradient. They need that heat to digest, but other times they're fine in anywhere. Uh, they just decide where they wanna be. So you can provide that uh, warm end with overhead heating. You can use a heat mat if you've got them in a cage where, where a heat mat works, but I like overhead heating. Uh, and your heat needs to be somewhere around 88 to 90 degrees. The cool end should be about 76 to 80 degrees. It's basically the same as a ball python. So pretty pretty easy to heat uh, if, if you're used to working with ball pythons. So what I would use for heating is a ceramic heat element that's a CHE or a heat heating panel, which is what I have in this cage down here. You can use a um, deep heat projector it would be fine and probably good for them. Anything that's not lighted. I never recommend a lighted heat source because you want that you want the heat on 24 hours, but you don't want a light on 24 hours. And a red light is still a light. It still creates illumination. So those red lights, even if you see an entire shelf full of them at the pet store, they're probably going to be right next to the heat rocks. Don't use them. There's no reason for a red light. So you can have a light in the cage. Just make sure that it's on a timer so that you know the snake has uh, 12 hours of, of dark and 12 hours of light or you know somewhere around that. Uh, you can have a plant light. I have a plant grow light in this bioactive cage that goes off at night. Uh, you can have an LED. You can have a UV light if you want. It's not necessary. There might be some benefits, but boas especially spend most of their day under the shaded canopy of dense forest. And beyond that, they're also spending a lot of time under the leaves, especially uh, the adult, the larger adult boas. I don't think I mentioned this, but a smaller boa like Handsome Dan will climb a lot, but then as they get bigger, heav heavier bodied, they're more of a terrestrial snake. And they do just um, sort of uh, snuggle into that, that uh, leaf litter that's on the ground. But make sure you're using the lowest UVB available. I don't remember what they call that. I'm just thinking of, of uh, Shade Dweller because I think that's 
Arcadia's term for it, but you want the lowest amount of UV for a boa. Humidity, 60 to 80 percent, give or take. It doesn't have to be exact. When the humidity gets under 60, I usually add a little bit of water to Handsome Dan's substrate and around, I, you know, I keep it around 80 percent if he's in shed. I'm measuring the humidity with a digital thermometer hygrometer. I just put this right into the substrate. And uh, that's that tells me that's pretty much what I'm using just for humidity. For my temperatures, I'm using a temp gun. This you got to have a temp gun. So uh, this way I can I can shoot the temperature right where the snake is sitting. And uh, he is 79.3 degrees right now, which is warmer than it actually is in here. Oh, I guess the ball is 77.3. Can spend a lot of time just temping everything if you want. But uh, this is interesting that he's warmer though than the than the ball 78 77.9. Okay, all right. So you know, let's not waste time. This is a long enough video already. Here we go. What else? The right substrate is going to be very helpful in keeping your humidity up or keeping it down depending on where you live. So you can use cypress mulch, cocoa husk, uh, bioactive soil. You, some people have good luck with paper. You can use aspen, but it's really only going to work for you if you're already in a very humid tropical climate. Uh, Aspen will help keep your humidity down, but that's going to be problematic for just about anybody else in any other part of the world. So uh, my favorite for, for where I am in Southern California is cocoa husk. That's uh, stuff that, that I just... Here. Here's a pinch of cocoa husk. I just add water to this when the humidity is too low and this acts like a little sponge and it just hangs on to the water and keeps the humidity stable for usually a week or two. Did you notice that I didn't say I mist down the enclosure every day or twice a day? I don't do that because when you mist, I say this all the time and some of you are probably getting tired of hearing me say it, but I see it constantly. Uh, when you mist your enclosure, it evaporates immediately. You're just putting a little layer of water on the top of everything and it just all evaporates and then you're back to square one with your humidity. You need to mix water into your substrate. As far as stuff to put in the cage, the most important thing is a water bowl. Make sure they have fresh water all the time in a water bowl. I change my snake's waters every few days. You also want two hides, one on both end. You want them to be able to hide in the warm end and hide in the cool end. And you want the hides to be exactly the same because you don't want your snake to prefer one hide over the other and then not thermoregulate appropriately just because they like this one hide better. So for Handsome Dan, this is his favorite hide right now. This is the only, I have two of these, but Everybody else has just black plastic hides. I happen to have these little Exoterra hides and he fits perfectly in these right now and he likes them. So I use those for him. He also gets other sort of little hides occasionally. And I make sure that he has multiple levels in his cage. He's got a shelf in there that he can get up on, but also just furnishings that I change in and out. So that's wood pieces, fake plants, might have a real plant in there occasionally that I just change in and out because that's good for their mental enrichment. The only thing that I don't usually change out is this ball. This is in his cage at all times because he likes to sit in it. So I leave that with him. And that's also why I hung it right there because he was seeming uncomfortable in my hands. So this is kind of his comfort spot. It's sort of like a security blanket for him. So. The purple ball stays in his cage at all times and uh, otherwise everything else changes. The other thing that I like to do is he has a spot where he, he spends a lot of time out of his cage and he has a spot on top of a rack that's kind of his and I change that around a little bit. He has his own hides in, in, uh, on that place as well and uh, I change that around because it's good to give them some mental en enrichment. It's cool to let them sort of check things out and they will explore around. They'll notice when you've changed anything in their enclosure. They'll check it out. It's really good to do for their brains. All right, let's talk about cage cleaning while we scroll the horde of keepers over on Patreon. First of all, let me say that if you're watching this video that when it comes out, I'm currently on my second trip to the Amazon jungle finding all kinds of boas in the wild and other snakes. So if you're interested in seeing content about that, the live stream that I'm going to do right after I get back, as well as uh, content from the, the Amazon, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Uh, okay, so as far as cleaning, here's what I do. 
I spot clean every day and I do a complete full change of all my enclosures every four to six weeks. Now, I'm very good at spot cleaning. I do it with chlorhexidine or F10, that's a veterinary grade disinfectant. And because I'm good at spot cleaning, I can sometimes stretch my full cleanings to every six weeks. If you're an average spot cleaner, make sure it's once a month. Big thanks to the Horde of Keepers over on Patreon who support the channel, and because of that, they get extra content and all kinds of perks. I really appreciate them. And big thanks, as always, to our channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs, and Gray Family Snakes. There's your discount codes for them. Now that you've got a boa, you've got to feed this dang snake. How are you going to do it? Well, boas should be slow grown and different people have different schedules of how they feed and when and what, uh, and most of them work. The thing that everybody pretty much agrees on though is that you should not overfeed your boa. So here's the feeding schedule that I like. A boa under a year old can be fed every seven to 10 days. If they're over a year, let's say a year to three years, they can be fed every 10 to 14 days. Over three years, you can go up every three weeks. Did I say that right? Over three years, every three weeks, yeah. And then at about five years, you might be feeding your snake uh, once a month, something like that. That's a generalized schedule and it has to do with how big that snake is and, and things like that. But the point here being that you should not overfeed your boas. A boa constrictor or a boa imperator uh, should be fed a smaller prey item and less often than a comparably sized ball python. Uh, now, your boa is going to eventually get bigger than a ball python, and you're probably going to, at that point, be feeding them something larger than you would ever feed a ball python. You might be feeding them uh, large rats, which I would never feed a ball python a large rat. Uh, or you might even get to rabbits if you've got a snake that's, that's big enough for it. Uh, so at that point, you're feeding them once every four weeks, maybe up to once every six weeks. I know some people do that and a larger uh, prey item. I don't think Handsome Dan will ever be that big. I think the biggest he'll ever take is, is probably a small to medium rat. Another difference between feeding a boa and a ball python is that your boa will have or should have a massive feed response. So tap training is important if you do that. I don't do tap training with Handsome Dan. I do target training with him. So every time he gets fed, he sees a green ball and that tells him that food is available. He often gets so excited that he strikes at the ball, but we're working on that. Uh, in fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to feed him a Reptilink and that might be the B-roll that you're watching right now is him in his new cage eating a Reptilink for the first time. These were sent to me by Reptilinks and so I've got a number of them to feed to different snakes. So we'll see if Handsome Dan takes one. My prediction is he takes it with no problem and probably won't hesitate. No need to feed live with a boa. They'll pretty much eat anything and they're always going to seem like they're ready to eat. You're going to think that your snake is hungry. This is for new keepers. That's just the thing about snakes. They won't regulate. They'll they'll eat themselves into oblivion. They'll they'll be massively obese and die very early in life if they ate every time they were out looking for food. So you have to be the one to regulate that. Don't feed them too much. Did I make that point? Are we are we good with that point? We got it, right? I feel like these are rules like with gremlins. Don't don't put water on them. Don't feed them after midnight. You know, actually a boa would eat just fine after midnight. That'd be that'd be a good time to feed them. Where are we at on this video? I wanted to show you an example of body condition, but uh, the way this snake is sitting in the ball, it's going to be very difficult. But boas are square-bodied snakes. They're not round-bodied. So a good body condition for a boa is a nice, muscular square. Uh, their belly shouldn't be much wider than their back. It should look pretty much like a square. They shouldn't have excess back fat. If you were to do like a cross-section of the snake, it should be like the shape of a piece of toast. Not a weird piece of toast with too much that's too wide on the bottom. You get it. Look at his face. Look how, look how handsome he is though. It's a good shot of handsome Dan. Let's talk about handling. Uh, boas in general are really docile and they can easily get used to being handled. They can strike defensively, but if they're socialized, they generally won't. Handsome Dan has only done it once uh, to me and it was within the first maybe week or two that I had him. Uh, and he's never struck since. And by the way, Central American boas are known to be pretty strikey. 
but he hasn't done it. So a baby boa can be socialized exactly the same way I always do with, with ball pythons, and that is just showing them your hand and letting them tongue flick on it themselves. And, you know, maybe opening their enclosure, putting your hand somewhere near them, let them come to you, and then let them tongue flick, and then that's it. Don't pick them up after that, don't mess with them. You want them to understand that this scent is, is not something that's that's going to be stressful for them. If you're going in all the time with your big monkey paws and yanking them out of their hide to play with them, they're going to associate your hand with stress. So sometimes when you go in there, maybe more often than not, you just show them your hand. Actually, I probably do that with Handsome Dan more, more often, even still, even though he's well socialized. If I see him, I'll uh, show him my hand, and if he wants to come out, He'll come out onto my hand. Usually, the times that I've that I handle him are when he's like halfway onto my hand already. Then I'll just pick him up and we'll have a handling session. But if he doesn't want to come out, he doesn't have to. He can just tongue flick on my hand, and I'll close his his enclosure. You know. But today is Boa Care Guide Day, and I needed him, and he did not want to be handled. I could tell that he didn't want to be handled because he was very squirrely and super squeezy on me, but just squirrely trying to get somewhere. That's why we did the ball. So if you're used to ball pythons, it's a very similar handling experience. The main difference is gonna be they're a lot stronger. They look at you as a warm tree, just like a python does, but they hang on to a tree way stronger than, than a python would. And also you've got that feed response. So you might have a ball python that you're used to opening their cage and just jumping in with your hands. You might not wanna try that with a boa. So tap training and or target training is, is really helpful with that. So what else do you wanna know about boa care? Put it in the comments and maybe I'll do a part two if I have enough fun boa stuff to talk about. Thanks for watching, see you next week.